very excited to have special guests with us. And the first of those special guests is Commander Ryder. And so I wanted to just say that Commander Dustin Ryder serves HHS Region 7 right here where we are. And he is here representing uh, the federal agency that supports our work. We're glad to have you here. Welcome, Commander Ryder. Thank you. You actually didn't come here to, to listen to me. You came here to listen to other brilliant individuals like Dr. Gasalvo. Um, I do have her bio, and she was the former Assistant Secretary for Health and the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. But I just want to point out some high, some high point of honors. She was uh, recognized as the Woman of Excellence in Healthcare by the Louisiana Legislative Women's Caucus. In 2013, Governing Magazine named Dr. Gasalvo one of nine public officials of the year. The American Medical Student Association recognized her with a Women's Leader Award in 2014. Modern Healthcare named her one of the 50 most influential physician executives in 2014. So again, this is the person that you want to hear. I do have to put in, I do have to put in a little blurb for us. As stated, I'm a federal officer and I'm in the regions here. So when she's gone, I'm still here and I'm still going to be the one that's partnering with you, myself and the Acting Regional Health Administrator, Captain Shari Jones. So many of you may know Admiral Jose Bellardo. Well, she's taken his place for right now, and hopefully she'll be the regional health administrator. Sorry about that plug for her. But, <laughs> <laughs> but again, Dr. DeSalvo, if you'll please come up here and save me from myself. <laughs> All right. Um, my, my job today is to provide an overview of some work that I had the chance to do uh, when I was uh, at HHS, and it's... Um, uh, an effort called Public Health 3.0, which I, I think you all will find is reflective of some of what we heard this morning and sounds like what some of what you all heard yesterday. Uh, and at the end, I want to talk a bit about sort of what's been happening to advance this disruptive movement in public health in the country and specifically what you all can do. And I very much look forward uh, to the dialogue. Just a little bit of, of level setting, which is to say that um, in this framework that we developed of Public Health 3.0, we were acknowledging prior eras of public health, and I want to just shape them in a couple of specific ways. One is to say this period of Public Health 1.0 would be the early origins of the practice of public health, a time when the epidemiology really pointed towards communicable disease, and the tools that were developed were really designed to address those. Some of those were actually um, interventions uh, like removing a pump handle uh, to, to create clean water, but um, also were a time when we developed vaccines and, uh, and antibiotics to really reduce rates of, of infection. But I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that in that, in that early period, uh, we were leveraging in public health tools that address social determinants. So I think as an example, in fighting the scourge of tuberculosis, housing policy was a really successful intervention to reduce rates of, of transmission. But nonetheless, it was really much more focused on communicable disease. In the public health 2.0 era, as the epidemiology changed, as the expectations of public health evolved, public health itself uh, began to take on additional responsibilities. And it was uh, said uh, this morning by Becky that people sometimes think that public health is for poor people. And I think this is a time when that began to emerge in the, in the mindset of uh, the people of this country, for sure. And that, that's partially because public health was there when others weren't. Uh, they stepped up to the plate to take care of populations who were uninsured or who were otherwise marginalized because they were homeless, because they had mental health issues, because they had HIV AIDS. Uh, it was also a time when public health was given additional responsibilities around preparedness. Um, and really had to step up the, the responsibilities, not only in everyday public health support, uh, but also in disaster. As public health began to manifest across the country at the local level, it also became more clear that it was very uneven and it was quite different. I, I have to say, I know it still is, but uh, bear with me. And uh, the, that in this time, uh, there, were, there were people at the national level in particular who wanted to put some structure on public health to professionalize it and have a way that we could define what the practice of public health ought to be at the state and local level and actually find a way to define it such that it could be accredited and it led to the public health accreditation movement that, that you all are fam familiar with today. And Some people would say it was a time when we really came of age uh, as governmental public health. 
there was a, a period that, that began really at the turn of this, this century when uh, several, several uh, significant external pressures began to uh, put, put some downward forces and sideways forces on, on public health, uh, some of which had to do with the Great Recession. And we've heard uh, again here and you hear everywhere you go in this country that there are funding challenges, particularly for local public health, though state and federal are not immune to it that in that period of time there was there were FTE or job losses, there was also funding losses, and that created a lot of strain for health departments around the country who were trying to decide if they should just do less with less instead of uh, trying to do uh, the same with less uh, because they were not going to, in the foreseeable future, get additional funding. It was also a time when the Affordable Care Act came into being, which created some interesting pressures, uh, some of which was the loss of clinical revenue for many health departments. Uh, it also meant that as they got out of the business of clinical care for whatever reason, uh, they lost FTE or staff that were clinical that, uh, for example, were helpful in times of, of disaster to, to staff shelters. But it also um, created a time when there was a new wave in health care that wanted to really understand population health. And so it began to bring health care a little closer, um, and in some communities a lot closer to public health through efforts around delivery system reform. So how could we create more value in the healthcare system and not just uh, generate funds for healthcare by doing more for sick people, but how could we work together to create health? The revolution in data and technology, some of which was spurred by the adoption of electronic health records across the country that's given us now a, a digital record of the healthcare of every body in this country. Um, actually, I, sometimes I, I say that we kind of exceeded our goal of every American having an electronic health record. Now, I bet many of y'all have multiple electronic health records. <laughs> and uh, we, we're working to sort of fix that and get them all into one place. Um, uh, happy to take questions on that later. But the, it, it, it is, in addition to just that, the new data coming in, new uh, machine learning and machine uh, and, and, and opportunities at artificial intelligence and natural language processing, this world of big data has cropped up and now we are um, sometimes using it to answer important questions, sometimes we're proving that water is wet, I fear, but nonetheless, um, public health has at its disposal a lot of more um, timely and, and, and actionable data than it potentially had in the past. And finally, uh, the epidemiology of morbidity and mortality is shifting again. So we went from a period of communicable disease to non-communicable disease in public health 2.0 phase, thinking about chronic disease like uh, diabetes or malignancy, a lot of focus on risk factors for cardiovascular disease. But as we have seen and are increasingly, I think, understanding from our daily work but also from the data, the, the, the challenges in this country now have more to do with the social determinants of health than, than uh, any uh, discrete medical issues. And that has pushed many health departments and, frankly, many communities into an era of public health 3.0. This is an organic movement that um, I certainly experienced as a health commissioner in New Orleans, but that I have seen and heard about all over the country and heard more examples uh, yet again today. It's not as though someone from on high said, this is how you must practice. It was that they were learning that they had to find a new way to do business. They had less resources, but they had new responsibilities, and there was a new attention needed to the social determinants of health, none of which could be done by one sector alone, certainly not public health. Uh, by itself uh, or even healthcare by itself, that if we were going to tackle uh, what is um, some, you know, 60 percent of our health outcomes, it was going to really take the true definition of public health, which is what we do together as a society to create the conditions which in, which, in which everyone can be healthy. Some of these communities were recognizing that they had um, disparities and gaps and that together they wanted to address those. Um, this has to do with zip code in some cases, but in other communities there, there are gaps based upon color of your skin. Um, and there are some communities though, in this slide, this, on this slide, uh, the, the image on your right, uh, is this data from Raj Chetty, which it was initially depressing because it showed us about the, the great disparity in longevity based upon income, um, gaps of 15 years for men based on being in the bottom 5% uh, or in the top of income. But if you took a closer look at his data, and he teased this out, there are actually communities that are working together, together to create the conditions in which everyone can be healthy. And if you live in a place like New York City or San Francisco, even if you're poor, the gap is less than if you live in a community like Dallas or Detroit. 
And so we certainly wanted to learn more about that. Again, I mentioned I had some personal experience with this as a health commissioner, learning to work in a collaborative fashion with our community to bring together new resources to address not only the medical determinants and the, the sort of traditional public health responsibilities, doing 1.0 and 2.0, <laughs> but building on top of that 3.0. And so we wanted to learn from other communities in a, in a sort of organized fashion and see if we could put a framework on this to help get a guide path forward. We chose five communities to visit, uh, one of which is near, nearby here, very, very nearby here in Kansas City. Some of y'all might have uh, joined us at that meeting. Um, these are not the only five communities in the country uh, that are doing public health 3.0 type work. But we selected them because they were well known, because they were different in a variety of ways, more rural, more urban, um, different geographies. And we invited uh, other communities from, from nearby to come share their stories as well, not just uh, those uh, listed on the slide, but these were the places that we chose. And we had morning bright spot conversations and afternoon uh, concurrent work groups where we asked questions about what was helping them be successful, what was in the way, and certainly what could we do as feds to be supportive, and what should the private sector be doing, what should local elected officials be doing, what should academia be doing to see that they could um, really reinvent themselves into this public health 3.0 frame and be able to work in a multi-sectoral fashion to address the social determinants of health. We put out a report uh, last last fall that is still available online at this web address if you'd like to, to read the, the details of it. Not only um, does, it, does it share the framework that I'm going to walk through in a moment, uh, but it also spotlights some great stories of what we heard and, and share some of the voice about what strategies they're using uh, that are successful. And I'll just reflect again, uh, they're ex but examples of many successful communities acro across the country. At the end of the day, um, we came up with five overarching recommendations uh, that HHS wanted to put forward of what we thought the world should look like, what success would look like if we could get to public health 3.0 for everyone in this country. And um, 51 actions, we, we couldn't get it down to 50. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we um, and if you, if you take a look at the report, I think you'll see that these in some ways cross map to what's been recommended in prior reports. So there's a good and a bad in that. I think there's still work we've all been talking about for a couple of decades that needs to happen to make public health successful. Um, some of the work got pushed off uh, because of the Affordable Care Act. A lot of it had to do with access to care. We might be teetering on the edge of needing to address that again, but we felt like these 51 would be the most impactful. So the overarching framework that we saw recurrently, um, I, I will be honest, we started with this as the framework, but uh, I told the team and I told myself that we would be open to throwing all this out the window and putting new things in when we listened to, to communities across the country. Um, but this is this, what we heard recurrently, and I would say that from what I heard this morning, these are the similar themes that come up in every community about what's necessary for success. Um, what are the key components? There has to be leadership. Sometimes it's um, a single charismatic leader who's passionate and really cares. Sometimes it's a group of them who come together recognizing that there's a strong need. In these communities, we chose to visit them because it was the local public health official, though not always entirely. I'll use Nashville as an example where Bill Frist really was the, uh, put out the rallying cry to pull together the public health community, but Bill Paul, who's the head of the health department there, was his tight partner uh, in the work. It's not just about strong leadership, though, that is willing to work with um, outside of its comfort zone. It's about having a, a workforce that is not purely in categorical, programmatic, siloed work. It's teams that are able to do cross-purpose and think about systems and policy and environmental level change. The second uh, common area was about essential infrastructure. Basically, they were accredited or they were on the way to get it accredited. Um, I, I think that this was a marker of their willingness to be transparent about process and be tight about how they ran their, their offices and most importantly, I think, to implement quality improvement as a part of the way that they did business, always trying to make sure that they were improving. That uh, essential infrastructure, though, blends quite a lot with strategic partnerships. Not only were they developing partnerships that were more than just a handshake, they were actually creating uh, organizations that were umbrellas that could share money and spend money based upon shared vision. This is collective impact model, but structured into a new 501c3. It allows them to blend and, and braid funds and frankly share governance and, and accountability at the end of the day. Um, the fourth area was about data analytics and metrics. I think it's probably still the most frustrating and weakest 
uh, area. It's women in data, but not much of it's actionable. Uh, there's not very many non-proprietary platforms that help help them use these tools, tools well, but those that are sorting it through and figuring it out have more information about in real time about their successes in their efforts, and that um, begets more opportunity for them to get more funding, but also to keep the energy going for the work to, to proceed. In the metric space, um, the theme that we saw was using community-wide metrics, uh, ones that look at things like walkable, walkable communities um, or policies around smoking, not just individual level health metrics. And the fifth area was about flexible and sustainable funding. They had figured out ways to blend and braid and bend and flex their funding to cr increase the size of the pie by bringing people together. I'm not thinking that, well, that's not my responsibility um, and, and so I'm not going to be involved in it, but actually really thinking through how they could pull, pull resources um, to make there be more than there were if they were working independently. That said, um, there were some recommendations that would make this um, work better and I look forward to, to having some more dialogue about these. The first was um, we recommended that public health leaders should embrace the role of a chief health strategist. This is something that, uh, that you all may be familiar with that came out of the Resolve and TIFA group. But John Auerbach is well known for having created this idea of a meta leader in public health. The second area is that public health departments need to engage with community stakeholders and form these cross-sectoral partnerships. Sometimes these are uncomfortable. It's with the business community or it's with payers. It's not always with organizations where we have a shared language and vocabulary, but the most successful communities are really thinking about ways that they could work with technology companies to, to, to really uh, advance their work. The third area was, a, was that we recommended that uh, public health accreditation um, for health departments should be reached, should reach into everybody in this country. So that would mean then that everybody lives in a community that has an accredited health department, whether that's at the state level or at the local level. Fourth, uh, that we need to have access to timely, reliable, granular, and actionable data. Uh, this is a recurrent theme that we heard uh, over and over again is that uh, they cannot build public health programs anymore on data that's as stale as two or three years old. And fifth, that funding for public health must be enhanced and substantially modified. Anybody who's ever worked in government and tried to get a, a report out of clearance, I hope you'll appreciate how hard it was to get that word enhanced in there. Um, but uh, <laughs> we, we really wanted to make a statement that, that as, as it stood, public health funding was, was insufficient for the needs of this country, that everybody was working off of smaller and smaller budgets, and we were asking them to do more and more over time, and it was going to break. And frankly, in some communities like Flint, it was breaking. And that we, we would have to also modify the funding. It, it just categorical funding was not going to be a way that we were going to really move forward into this world of public health 3.0 and see that public health could do what it needed to do to save people's lives every day. I'm going to um, run through quickly the last two slides, which are just to say that um, before, before I left office, I wanted to get some things rolling to make sure that we put some wedges in the door. Uh, we, we planted some seed money with some national organizations, including NACHO and ASTO, to work particularly on leadership, the chief health strategy, strategy development, strategist development, but also ASTO, um, to make sure that uh, there was an opportunity for better partnerships between Medicaid and public health programs at the state level. Um, we had uh, an initial meeting or, uh, with Medicaid and public health officials at the state level uh, that, that was the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast, and I'm hoping that ASTO is going to continue some of that work. We added accreditation and accountability expectations to some of the grants across HHS in SAMHSA and in HRSA and the Office of the Assistant Secretary and provided some additional seed funding to FAB to help them think about a public health 3.0 world. There's some exciting work happening in the data and metric space, not only within government, thinking about creating some, some measures that are available f through existing data that's non-proprietary that could help you in more real time measure your community's health in addition to individual health metrics. And I just want to give a nod to the De Beaumont Foundation for their work about the, the policy gold medal cities to really thinking about how we can measure and mark success at the policy level. This morning, it was already mentioned about the Accountable Health Communities grant that came out. I would tell you all to pay a lot of attention to what CMS is going to do. As public health people, you may not be thinking a lot about the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, but watch my hand. Pay a lot of attention to what they're going to do. 
the Medicaid programs also, the people, the, the career staff in the federal space really were excited about this Public Health 3.0 work. They really understood, based on what they had seen in data, how important it was to address the social determinants of health in addition to medical, and they really want to understand how to advance this, but many private payers are in the space as well. What can you do? You know, um, the, the kind of question that you get asked when you say public health needs more money, public health needs more flexible money is, well, how much money does public health need? What's the gap? What does it cost to, do, to provide public health for people in this country? And I would stand here in front of you today and say nobody can answer that question. I know people are working on it and, and in individual states, but I couldn't go to Congress tomorrow and say what we need every year is X amount of money, or if we're going to transform public health like you did the health care system with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, this is what it would cost every year to provide that kind of transformation. So everyone needs to keep working on their foundational capabilities and cost associated. I would just want to point to Kentucky, who, where I was just there last week. They are really rocking hard on this and want to figure it out for their state so that they can, they can really begin to define a gap. Because once we know that, then we can start thinking about, as a country, sort of funding levels. I have a lot of people here in, who are training the next workforce. Boy, they really need to be trained in policy and, and, and feel comfortable going into a boardroom just as much as they do going into a schoolroom or a classroom. Uh, we need to make sure that they can work with some of these um, um, more corporate type organizations who have a shared mission of a healthy community. We got to get accredited. We got to show that we're not saying we're good because we say we're good. We got to show that we can, we can meet the muster of an external body and be transparent. We need to use the tools that exist, like CDC's Health Impact at Five Years, which really address the social determinants, or the 618 work, is, which is for public health and Medicaid. If you're not familiar with them, please go to CDC's website, learn about them. They're toolkits, they're off the shelf, they're ways that you can get rolling right away in your community and multi-sectoral collaborations to address the social determinants. Take advantage of the fact that right now there's a lot of federal interest in pushing work to the state and local level. This is a great time to be in your community wanting to do work there's going to be a lot of interest from the federal in the federal space and frankly from the private sector to see that we can solve challenges locally it's not going to come out of washington and uh, unfortunately the epidemic of substance use disorder which has roots in the social determinants should be a rallying cry and it's a way that we could maybe show some impact of this new kind of way of working together and the last thing i would really ask of you all especially the practitioners but also uh, those of you who are in the academic space is we've really got to be uh, bold and ask ourselves some, some hard questions. You know, when I started this, when I, when I started my work as the health commissioner uh, in New Orleans, when the mayor asked if I would take that job, I asked why we had a health department in New Orleans. Did we still need a, a health department in the city? And um, I asked that question a lot at, while I was there, not because I didn't love everybody that worked there and the work that we were doing, but it's always important to me to, to, to call the question. And we called the question when we started Public Health 3.0 because maybe, maybe local public health isn't needed anymore in 2017 and beyond. I mean, I obviously think it is, but um, I'm not sure it's needed in the structure and format that it's in. And I think we need to ask ourselves some really hard questions about what are the existing statutory responsibilities that we ought to have, what's the minimum size for a local health department. If, we're, if we want to maintain the jurisdictions that we have, how do we share services so that we're not duplicating? If we have overlapping jurisdictions, how do we deal with that in a way that is efficient and effective such that when we're going with our hand out to whoever to say, we need more funding for our gap to do our work, they're not saying, yeah, but, but the county was just here and you're the city and then the state was just here and aren't y'all all doing the same thing? These are not easy questions to answer, but uh, this is a place where I think not only those of us in the field, but also those in Washington leading organizations need to ask themselves these hard questions. Leadership at APHA and at NACHO and ASTO, what is, I call it public health 3.0, but what is the future of public health? How do we best serve the people of this country using new technology, using the relationships that maybe we haven't fully leveraged, and thinking about the kinds of root causes of illness and of morbidity and mortality in this country that we have to address today. We know it's doable. We've heard stories this morning. I've seen them all over the country, every time zone, every temperate zone, small communities, communities with no local health officer, communities with storied local health officers like, like Rex. It just really is going to take all of us being thoughtful about our structure together, but also being willing to 
let go of some, some of the past and, and, and let this disruption happen uh, and, and measure and mark along the way. So I thank you all um, for the work that you're doing. And I encourage you to keep running because it's really great stuff and I look forward to your questions.